know what your code is doing to SQL Server. Because if you have something that's writing your code, it's a completely different ballgame. And we'll see what, what that can mean for us. Um, Winston Wolf, look it up, Pulp Fiction. I totally rock, all that good stuff. <laughs> um, it's amazing how high SQL Server can scale. Right? With uh, SQL Server 2016, some of the awesome sauce coming out in that. BWIN, European gaming company, is now getting, I believe it's 1.2 million transactions per second, I think it is. Per second from one SQL Server box. Let that sink in. That's like Visa, MasterCard, Discover, American Express on Black Friday. Steady state throughput. It's just mind-blowing. Right. I know of tens of terabytes, actually hundreds of terabytes SQL Server data warehouses. I would not be surprised if they're not somewhere in the world pushing petabyte size. I've heard of trillion row fact tables. It's just pretty, pretty amazing. And then we can throw things like ORMs at it or put functions around columns and where clause and wrong data types and totally hose things up. But the good thing is if you do things right, it's going to go where you need it to go. Okay, if you need BI, I can introduce you to some good ones. So over the 20 plus years I've been consulting on SQL Server, I've developed a number of guruisms. And this is the one that's applicable for here. Anything that allows a developer to slap together code more quickly is inversely proportional to the scale and performance you're going to get from that code. If developers aren't putting gray matter into what they're typing on their keyboard, you can't scale, you can't be concurrent. You can write code really quick and you can get it out. If you've got good DevOps and continuous integration, continuous testing and deployment, you can do it on a very rapid cycle. But you can't make it go fast. And we need to make sure that we do that. I mean, when you want to scale, Google and Facebook, they're looking to shave microseconds off of things that they do because they do them so darn frequently that that little 10 or 12 microsecond savings makes them not have to buy another couple hundred thousand servers perhaps over the next some number of years, right? So Entity Framework does that. If you know how to use it, like any tool, it can help you be more productive, substantially so. If you don't, it can be an impediment just like any other tool. So, but since it is something that basically writes code for us, we are stuck with the intelligence, limitations, development cycles, bug fixes, whatever, of the entity that created the thingy that you use to write code for you. In this case, it's Microsoft, and in Hibernate, it could be whatever organization or people uh, contribute to that project. There's, there's others out there. ADO.net is the thing that writes code for you. You don't have to write low-level ODBC calls and things like that to talk back and forth. And it can really hose things up, as you might have noticed if you were in my last session. So, not all of these are related to data access, but since we're talking about SQL Server, we're going to focus on those. And I was an officer in the United States Navy, and when I was there, that wasn't read the fine manual, but it still means the same thing. Um, you you've, can't just read a blog post and start slapping stuff together with anything. You just can't. If you do, you may be lucky and your company is small and it never gets big. Well, that's not what we want, right? We want to grow. We want to you know, make money and ha drive the bottom line. And, or if we're nonprofit or we're doing you know, free stuff, we want to help more people or more companies with our nonprofit. So to be successful, we have to be able to scale. Now, I'm not a guru in the in hibernate ORM type stuff. I know enough to be dangerous and I know enough to tell other people the things to look out for. Uh, this deck and the samples that it's based on, uh, I'll give you a link at the end that will give you the 
uh, a post you can go find. It gets uh, much of this and even more deeper stuff from Ben Emmett from Redgate, who also posted up on the GitHub the full stack sample. So if you are a, dot, a .NET Entity Framework coder or you have some back at your shop, they can take this and play around with it, tweak things, see why they're good and bad, and uh, learn a lot. We're also going to use uh, some screenshots from a product called uh, Ants Performance Profiler, which if you do development and tuning, it is absolutely amazing. You can get down to granular levels such as HTTP posts and gets, see how many times they were called, what they did, where they went, all the way down to it hit that stored procedure in that particular database and all the performance levels in the whole stack. It's really a game changer. So Entity Framework is a, a way of exposing objects, right? And doesn't have to really know what's going to be in them. It can materialize them or get them when it needs them. Uh, and all that behind the scenes type stuff uh, causes a lot of problems, right? The materialization is the thing that gets in the way here. So too greedy with rows. So we have a school entity and we want to say there's a school in New York City, right? So we have a city as New York and we say list the schools and then we filter where city is equal to city. And the problem is it doesn't look ahead to see what are you going to do with this data? So when you say grab the data, it grabs all of it. It doesn't know that the very next thing you're going to do is filter that data down to 342 schools that happen to be in New York City or, or if, it, if it were a state. So that process of not being able to look ahead and see what's going to happen really gets in the way if we just sit down and start slapping together code. So what's missing from that query that's sent to the database? There's no where clause. All the rows, right? Up off a disk, in the RAM, you know the drill, right? Maybe crush, crushing our web tier or middle tier because we brought, maybe we have all the schools. Maybe there's 2.2 uh, million of them, right? All off a disk. So then filter them in the engine where the entity framework code is, right? Instead of doing it where the data is, right? This is definitely a case where, remember I talked a lot about don't do stuff in SQL Server? Well, <laughs> filtering down to a small set of data, especially if you can do something efficient like an index seek, then that's going to be a dramatic win. You have to know that this is happening. And if you just run the code on your laptop, any, anybody ever heard of think what ran fast in development Right? If I had a nickel, okay? You can't tune small data. You can only, you can only tune large scale data because if you only got a thousand rows in your schools table, it will scan it every time and be instantaneous and you're like, my code rocks. And then you put it up where you got a million and it rolls over and dies. So if you know what you're doing though, you can not see my little green dot. <laughs> Um, so you can write it this way, which basically inlines the filtering into one statement, but you have to know that you need to do this. And unless you capture profiler traces of your thing or ants or some other way, extended events, see what your code is doing. And oh, by the way, know that it's this piece of code that's currently getting executed, right? Because that's the thing that is another kind of side effect of these code generators. How do we know where that statement came from? Well, if you're debugging it, you can be pretty sure that I just hit F5 on that line. It's that code that gener generated it. What if you have a three million line application of this stuff and you're tuning and you see this really bad, ugly query come in and it takes 30 seconds to run and does 400 million IO and it's this big. Where did it come from? in that millions of lines of code. I've been at shops where I've asked developers, where did this come from? 30, 40 minutes to find out where that code got generated from because you don't actually see this extent stuff and from and all that in the code. You see something that looks like that. 
can be very difficult just to figure out what you need to go fix in a complex application. So if you know to do this, you can write it that way or use an iQueryable. Right? So if you do, in Hibernate, by the way, exposes a lot of the same stuff, just different syntax. In plus one. So we have now students, pupils, who are at the schools. Okay, and we have a foreign key, which can be a good thing for both data integrity's sake and sometimes it can do uh, helpful things for our optimizer. All right, so we want to list out the pupils for the New York schools. So we say, now we remember, see we're learning here, we filter in line with our grab. And then we do a string builder and we say, go through the pupils and count them. Because that's what we want to do. So in Ant's performance profiler, the problem here is the hit count. also seen down here, okay? And that hit count is the number of times that it goes to the database to get the students. So it's in, get the school list, and then uh, one, excuse me, one to get the school list, and then in, however many you have, iterative trips, round trip to the database to get additional information. Lazy loading, right? Grab the stuff and iterate. If you iterate in SQL Server, all is lost. You can't scale. We need to do set-based operations almost uh, without exception, okay? So this actually can still run pretty quick in your data center which has a 10 gigabit fiber backbone between the server that's running this code and the SQL server. And your SQL server is reasonably sized and it's indexed and it makes it still seem like it's fast. Doesn't mean it's efficient or scalable, right? So if your salespeople go out and they sell to a company that's 200% bigger than all the rest of your current clients put together and now they backload 10 years worth of data, crash and burn, okay? Another place where this might cause a problem, up in the cloud. Because up there, if you forklift a chatty app up into the cloud, dead on arrival. And I've seen it over and over again. Because the latency up there isn't measured in microseconds. If you're lucky, it's milliseconds. Or if you're lucky, it's milliseconds because your box happens to be here and the server's right there. But then this server, the infrastructure up in the cloud says, well, we need to move that and do some stuff here. So you're going over on the other side of the data center. So we just tripled your latency for your network round trip between your app and your devs, uh, SQL server. Or worse, oh, we're gonna bring this part down. So you're going across town to the other data center or across the state and your latency just went up by a factor of 10x. So that can be a real problem. Chatty apps, big problem up there. So again, you have to know that this is a problem. So here we can say, get the schools, filter, and this is basically a series of dots, so they all get rolled up into one mismatch. Include the pupils and bring those back, all right? So the problem here is that the developer didn't really think about what the business requirement was. They just said, I need schools, give me schools. Or well, the next thing, I need to count them, do the count. They didn't step back and say, what's the objective? The objective is to say schools, comma, count star, group by schools, right? Which is really what we're looking at here. Do we want to bring all the data back to the middle tier and loop over it in the middle tier? even just in one statement that joins the two tables together, which is what this would do. What we really want is an efficient set-based way to do the objective, which in this case is a select school, comma, count, star, from school joined pupils, where school is New York, group by school. Okay, which could be done as a stored procedure. Thankfully, all the major ORMs allow you to execute stored procedures. 
and they know the metadata about them, so it can help you write the thing that's going to execute the stored procedure. You get IntelliSense, and it knows that this parameter data type is a varchar 35, not an invarchar 35. Maybe. We'll see there's some issues with that. But it, you can do stored procedures when it's right to do that. And it really is right to do that in a lot of cases where you need the best performance. Okay? But a key point, don't iterate when you don't have to. Too greedy with columns. So now we want to print the name of this student at a particular school. We have an integer school ID. We do the things that we're supposed to do, we've already learned about. And then we concatenate the names and we print them out. So here we can see it created a variable. It actually is the right data type. It's the ubiquitous identity integer 1-1 clustered primary key that everyone puts on every SQL Server table, even when it's not right to do so. So it gets what we want, right? But if you remember back to the code, it was concatenating just the first name and the last name. But all the columns on the table are pulled in. Lift it off a disk, into RAM, forcing stuff out, you know the drill. Okay? All the data, MP3, varchar 5000 comment field, right? Because when the code was run, it didn't look ahead and say, oh, you're really only going to reference these two. I'll just grab those two. Can't do that. So you, the developer, have to use your brain, the gray matter, and say, I know that I'm only going to use those two. I have to write code that's only going to touch those two. Okay. Yes? Is that the code which is running against the SQL Server? Is it an SP execute as code? Uh, that was the code that's executed here. Um, there are things you can do to get the SP execute SQL, kind of like ADO.net also. Uh, the, the reason why I'm asking is that when you declare, so that the entity framework is declaring a variable, it does have, so the issue here is with this code, it's declaring a variable and using it in a where clause, which actually is not the same thing as parameterized stuff. It uses distribution and so this has other performance issues in addition to the fact that it's getting all the columns, right? But while I got this up here, it's a, it's a good thing to point out. Um, if you were a tuner and you wanted to make this query go fast because it gets called a lot. You actually were, would not be able to tune this because it's grabbing all the columns. You're just like, well, if it wants all the columns, the best I can do is make sure there's an index on that uh, school ID, right? Because you don't know that it really only needed the first name and the last name and you could create and a non-clustered index, last name comma first name, which now is a covering query or covering index for the actual work that's being done out in the, the application. So now as, as tuners, one of our best tools in, at our disposal, uh, indexing and especially a covered index, we, do, we don't even have the ability to know that we should do that. Okay? So. All the stuff comes up off a of disk, right? And there's lots of stuff associated with that. Locks and latches. I mean, locks and so concurrencies down, performance. But then we can't do the covered index thing or any kind of index in that case. But we have the ability to write better code if we know what we're doing, if we read the fine manual and look at the code that's being generated. We can force it and say within the statement, only get these two things. And since they're dots, they're carried on. This is one collection of stuff that gets interpreted at runtime uh, to build the proper statement and just get the columns. Okay? Data transfer objects, if you're a, an any framework person, is another way to do this, where you can declare, uh, such as this, the way to do those columns. But you gotta know that you need to do this. Mismatch data types. Talked about this yesterday in the performance tuning pre-con. Talked about it today as the number one thing that I see in aggregate 
in uh, 20 years of consulting on SQL Server for performance problems. So we want to search for 90210 zip code and it's a, it's a bar char or something so we declare a string and we set it and we do all that include stuff that we've now learned we need to do and really takes a long time to run on our production box so we pull out our um, pull out the code and run it in management studio you ever had that happen you capture something in profiler because it was taking a long time and you run it in management studio and it Bam, just like that. Well, there's set statement differences and other reasons and things that can cause you to get a new and different and sometimes better query plan, and that alone can be the reason. Sometimes it's simply because the data wasn't in the buffer pool yet, and now it is. So, but that's what we're looking at. But really the code is this. And we'll do this one in red because it's really bad. It's a little difficult to see, but that's a in, and that's a max. It's the in that kills us. Remember, Unicode, convert implicit, and that's what's happening here. But you can see down below, we actually did bring just the columns that we needed. That's cool. Okay. So wrong data type, implicit conversion, no statistics, CPU burn, scan. Okay. By the way, that convert implicit knowledge is actually stored in the query plan itself. You can go and see that in the XML. And Jonathan Cajas wrote a code snippet that will shred your query plans and your plan cache on your SQL server and give you all of them that have convert implicit in them. So you can actually go find out where they're happening and go look at your code and make them go away. Do note that shredding a multi-gigabyte plan cache can affect the performance of the server while it's running, so do be careful with that. But it is really nice to be able to find it without having to go look at your code and say, is that the right data type? Is that the right, the convert implicit being in the plan, you can find them yourself. So the problem here is that the variable, we just said string something and it didn't explicitly make it the right guy when it was creating the parameter or the, excuse me, the variable that was used for the query. So that varchar 20 causes all the problems that we know. Scans the biggie, hits our shared lock, hits concurrency, CPU burn. Okay. We have to make our code use the right data type to the best of the language's ability. And it means we have to write more code, use gray matter to build better code so that it can be more efficient on SQL Server. No matter what you're using to write your code, that needs to happen if you want to scale, perform well, and have good concurrency. So just that one little thing, and it might run several orders of magnitude faster. Large tables, you can get five or six orders of magnitude improvement. Okay? So, if you let Entity Framework build your model for you, meaning your storage structures, which it can actually do, it's got a thing called Code First, and it will actually build your tables. And as you write code and add things to it, it will just add columns and do all that stuff, all under the covers. So, Another guruism for you, code first, performance last. We've got to intelligently build our own data structures based on the business requirements and the needs of the application. We can't let uh, automated doohickey do that for us. It's not going to work out well. Okay? So because we don't let EF control everything, it doesn't have that knowledge, which I think it should keep. Right? It should know, it does have a model, and it should know that that column is a varchar 20, and it should never create an in varchar anything, much less a max, uh, for that. But again, Microsoft Entity Framework Development Team, just like your shop, has a limited number of hours to devote to making new stuff and features and bug fixes and vacation and you know, family leave and all that stuff that they can't do everything that they like to do 
or that we would like them to do. So we're stuck with whatever they give us and we have to know how to make the best of it. Overly generic queries. So open-ended search, I call it. You give someone a web page and it's got first name, last name, medical record number, date of birth, some other fields maybe, little text boxes or maybe choice boxes and they can pick, put something or nothing in any of those. It's a very common uh, business requirement to have uh, that kind of search. And logically what we want is for the code to look at what they gave us and do the Boolean logic that is required to say this is actually what we need. And if we go through this with some Boolean knowledge here and the double pipes are ORs and the double equals are it, they do equal. So here's the actual inputs for the four fields that we were given by the user for this particular call. First name was Ben and the last name city and postal zip were all nulls. No value was placed in there by the user. So looking at the logic here for the predicate, first name is, is null or the first name on the field is equal to the first name. Well the first name is not null and so this part is what we want to match. Okay, And it has to match because or true this would be true. Uh, then and double ampersand says and the last name is null or the field last name is equal to the input last name. In this case the last name is null. So this part here evaluates to true in Boolean or true I don't care what's on the right hand side of that. That evaluates to true regardless of the right hand side. Basic Boolean. And true. Well and true I don't actually need that part of the predicate because it's true. There's, it, you can just eliminate for this call you can literally remove that entire section because it's always true. Same thing for city and zip. So really my predicate for this single call should be, to be most efficient, first p dot first name equals Ben. Is everybody following that? Okay, you'll get download this and play around with it. Uh, it's, it's actually already up on the SQL Saturday schedule page. Okay, now this is often included uh, with pagination because it doesn't help to show someone 273,482 rows that match their filter. The hum humans just can't make use of that. So in this case we give them the first 100, first 50, whatever their setting might be for the application. So all of that logic doesn't distill down to that which we know for that set of inputs it logically that's what it should be. And if it did do that, and I had an index on first name, I might be able to do an index seek and a bookmark lookup and a very efficient plan to solve or to bring back the results for that query. However, this is what we get. So we see the badness of the invar chars. Note they're all the same size. That's the limit of an invar char thingy in SQL Server. So if they happen to be not Unicode, then we have all that stuff that comes from the wrong data type. But note there's a whole bunch of them. Also it comes down here and we've got the dreaded is null or. And that is not the same thing as what we determined it could have been because this is a SQL Server query. Now logically it could actually shortcut this execution to just the thing that we need and it would give us the right answer for this execution and it could do so very efficiently. However, the query optimizer can't just give you this right answer this time and be okay with that when some other set of inputs would give you a different output or effect. And if it did shortcut out the other parts of the filter, clearly you can see where somebody now supplied a, a zip code or a, first, a last name and 
that query that they shortcut would give the wrong answer. And we just can't have that. So it has to write a query that's going to guard against all possible inputs and always give the right answer, which carries a ton of negative consequences. Right? If you have that is no or, and you may write it in your own store procedures, I've seen it at quite a number of clients for the, exactly this open-ended search, it's devastatingly bad from a performance standpoint. Okay? Um, and in my common T SQL mistakes, I have an example in there that shows you how you can address those issues that I didn't get to cover last session. Uh, Dynamic SQL, believe it or not, is one of the best ways to address this because you give the optimizer only and exactly what it needs for that set of executions, just like we know logically it should have. Right? Um, and if you do things really intelligently with the dynamic SQL, you can make your pagination way more efficient than doing something like row number over order by, which all puts all the stuff into tempdb or a temp object for sorting and grouping or numbering to spit out the first 50 or the seventh 50 or the hundredth 50. Crazy inefficient. So a stored procedure could be the way if you do it right. Conditionals in, in a new framework logic. Do note though, if you do use dynamic SQL, whether you generate it in your own app or in a SQL Server stored procedure, you must always guard against SQL injection or I can own your whole environment in about five minutes. All the servers if you do things wrong uh, and allow SQL injection with improper permissions on your server, which sadly too many people do. And most of the major hacks that have happened in the last, oh, 15 years at least, are some form of SQL injection. Note, not just on SQL Server. Okay? So we need to address these to have good performance. Option recompile is a really good thing here on newer versions of SQL Server. Okay. But you can't, within any framework to my knowledge, you can't just say add option recompile to the end of my statement because remember there's no statement. It's generated at runtime. So you have to jump through some hoops to capture the stream of queries going out of the Entity Framework engine and post pinned option recompile to them. But it's a sledgehammer. It does all the queries which we probably don't want. Okay? So in that case, it really lends itself towards a properly crafted stored procedure or building your own dynamic SQL within any framework. SP Execute SQL is your friend there to stay away from the SQL injection potential. Okay? <coughs> Plan cache. So, a lot of times we like the reuse of the plans. Uh, a lot of times we don't. We need to know which side of the coin we're on at any given moment for a particular set of queries. Um, so the problem with the plan reuse is if you have one space character difference between query A and query B, they will get a different query plan generated because they don't hash to the exact same value one piece of white space or obviously any other textual difference and otherwise it could be exactly the same and you get another query plan and if you add a space the query plan is obviously going to be exactly the same as the other one so now you might have two single use or three or twelve or seven hundred thousand any character difference so any framework does or can be set up to generate parameterized queries however uh, there's some things that you can do wrong with it and with the ADO.net where you'll get parameters that are the size of the data that's being put in them for that execution. Like last name Bowles would be five. Last name uh, Junebug would be whatever that is, eight or something. Okay. And it makes the variable declarations different, which makes them hash to different values, which means you've got a whole bunch of other plans. With skip and take, which was that part that we're doing the pagination part, it actually does the character-based differences too. Okay? So that skip and take that we do to paginate our values comes out and it specifically specifies 
the offset and fetch values. Offset fetch, easy way to write pagination, where we don't have to do that row underscore number over order by where row number between 1 and 50 or whatever. Uh, doesn't mean that it's actually going to be the most efficient way to do this, but it's easy to write. The problem is those values change. If I click next, the next time I call that, it's going to be 41800 and fetch next 100. That's one character difference, 7 to an 8, whole new query plan, which is probably should be exactly the same plan, but we can't get plan reuse there. And query plans, big pile of XML, they can be megabytes in size, and you know where the plan cache memory comes from? They, it steals it from the buffer pool, and it's actually literally called stealing. <laughs> if you run DBCC memory status, you'll see stuff called stolen pages. So we're taking RAM away from our buffer pool, which means now we don't have the data in the buffer pool that we might need some of the time, more often than we would if we left that there. So now we have to do more I.O., which incurs all kinds of overhead and performance problems. Okay, so now those numbers, you know, they, they change. So we need to know that if we're doing pagination, we need to do something different. And if we have Actually, if we have any ORM going into our system, we should have optimized for ad hoc workloads on, almost without exception. Personally, I think most systems, or almost all, should have this on also. And what this does is, it doesn't store the big, fat XML plan cache the first time it gets executed. It says, I'm going to compute a hash of it. I'm going to burn some CPU. Remember, we want to burn trade CPU ticks for other stuff, because CPU ticks is the thing we have way more of than anything else in SQL Server. And it might be a few hundred bytes or maybe a few thousand bytes. And we'll store the, cat, the hash value in our plan cache on first execution. And if that never gets called again, it's some few hundreds of bytes or thousands. It sits there, eventually it gets aged out. It's not a megabyte and a half. Now, if you get the same plan again and the same hash and it checks and it goes, oh, that's already in the cache? You've called it twice. I think you're going to keep calling it, so I'm going to store the whole plan up there so it would be more efficient to do that. Question in the back. Uh, there's not a question here. Um, small uh, addition to what you said. Uh, doesn't always help, help because of this extent of packets. It's generated from the beginning when you just initialize the application. So pretty often, especially with can hibernate, it depends how you actually initialize the mappings it will most probably generate totally different indexes. So the, the like Now you say indexes or the, the words that are used, the extent one and extent two and things like that? Okay, so he was saying that the, uh, in Hibernate, um, in some cir circumstances, actually gives you different characters for the things in the select statements, right? In, in any frame, okay, I, w I wasn't aware of that. But that's just another reason that things are going to be different. So again, another plus for using the optimized for ad hoc workloads. Now there's edge cases in really high volume uh, scenarios where the lookup of the hash in the plan cache can actually become a bottleneck. And I think I've seen that twice in the real world. It's, it's, it's a pretty esoteric thing, but it, it does exist. So what we want to do is actually kind of parameterize that fetch and uh, the offset and the take. And we can do that uh, in Entity Framework 6 or higher. And if you're on anything before 6, you really need to move up. And I believe 7 is out now, which also has some, some fixes, right? Remember, the more they work to do things, the hopefully better it's going to get. Um, so the Lambda here will allow you to compute the values and pass them in. And we get parameterized offset and fetch, which would be, uh, which gets us plan reuse. Okay. Inserts, onesie onesie, don't iterate in SQL Server. If you got 50,000 rows to insert in, you know, a, a file or a set of data, you get to do it round trip. So A, that's chatty, 
which means network latency stuff, which in the cloud is going to be a problem. But also, each time you do, it's a connection. Then you have to go through all that, and you send the stuff in. That's locks and latches and transaction log activity and dirty pages, and then be done with that. And then the next time in, you may actually put the data on exactly the same page, but you did more transaction log, which has to commit before it goes in and then back, and do that 50,000 times. It's crazy inefficient. Right? We want to do bulk or batch activity when we're inserting data where it's appropriate. Right? Um, there is a thing out there in the EF.bulkinsert which can help you with that. And I believe in any framework 7, uh, if anyone's using it, can you verify is that out and does it actually have that in there? I was told that it was and it should be out already, um, which has SQL bulk capabilities baked in, which is, it really can be very, very uh, much more efficient to do bulk inserts instead of the iterative onesie onesie stuff. Okay. And again, uh, the more network latency you have, uh, the worse the problem is going to be. And it can be variable in the cloud because your machine gets moved somewhere else. Okay. So again, don't let Anything other than knowledgeable people write, create your data structures. Uh, and uh, in Hibernate, I don't know, does in Hibernate have a code first kind of thing? Will it build your, okay. Yeah, somebody says that, that they think it does. Uh, but we don't, we don't really, really don't want to do that. Plus, think about, you, you do have Entity Framework set up and it built this really awesome model. And, it, and you did, maybe it did fairly well at it. But you're making some changes, and you can actually say refresh, and it will literally recreate all your database objects for you. But like all of my clients, you're, you go into your database as SA, and you thought you were connected to development, but you were actually connected to production, and it dropped all the tables and recreated them. And I've did you, have you ever done that? No, I've never did it, but I think the name of it is perfect. Yes, I have seen it. That's, that's called a resume resetting event. <laughs> and I've, I've seen it happen. Had to help a client try to recover from that oopsie. It's scary, right? I mean, you think about the horror of just dropping one table or running a delete without a where clause or something. You're like, click the red X before it finishes, right? All the objects, poof. Question? I uh, just want to add something, but uh, there is another way, it's like data wasters, which is like the Microsoft uh, has some code generator for that. For which one? Uh, data wasters, not code, code first, data wasters. Database fest? Yeah, it yeah, like first you have your database and then the entity framework create like the uh, entities for it. Mm -hmm. So you can use this one, but uh, I think uh, you can change the T4 template which it has is for the code generating and you can edit that and you can imp improve that in, uh, to really read the data from the database and for example like for the environment. So it's another layer between Entity Framework and the database? Uh, actually it's like uh, you just uh, in import your whole model of your database by every change in the data which you import. Your okay, so it's basically a way to look at your existing schema and build the model for you. Yeah, and that, that's okay because that means that you have a schema that hopefully some intelligent person or group built for your data storage. Yeah, exactly. you can change Which, the that's, that's the thing that you really need to do, right? Write data types, the smallest data type that you can possibly use for that data, right? If you have a, a gender field, well, don't store that as an integer or, I mean, I've seen that, F four bytes of storage when it, if you go with just two, then that's actually a boolean, that's a bit, zero or one. You can code zero to male, one to female, whatever. If you got allow multiple, then you can do a tiny int and have 256 different possible values, right? And I've, I've seen gobs and gobs of literally boolean fields be integers. That's 32 times more storage than you need for a bit, 32 times. And size matters because it's storage, and even worse, it's memory. 
RAM. We want things, that's microsecond time scale that we're wasting. I don't want to do that, right? So, other issues here. Um, if, if something is multi-platform, multi-database, it can't necessarily do spiffy stuff for database A that it has the features for, but database B or C doesn't have that. Unless the developers that built that actually code it to know, okay, I'm in database type A, I can do this cool windowing function thing that I can't do in those others because they don't have it yet. That means that they have to spend more time doing that, so they probably don't. One of my favorites for that cross-platform issue is the major ERP vendors. And all the ones that I've worked on in the past, I haven't worked with one in hardcore for about four or five years though, they say, I run on DB2 and I run on Oracle and I run on SQL Server. And maybe they tune it really well for one of those three. It's probably not SQL Server. And it does really ugly baseline default bare bones stuff because that's the thing that's going to run on all of them. And oftentimes it's actually awful on all of them. You'll see cursors, you'll see server side cursors all over the place in those because that's the thing that'll run on all of them. And in SQL Server, you've got to buy really big hardware then because it's, it's multi-platform, right? That's not a good thing for us, right? You can't tune the code. Sometimes you can't, it's really hard in a big app to even find where the code came from. And that's scary to not know what's making a, a SQL Server statement or have to waste a lot of the developer's time to go figure out where did it come from. And they might be wrong. They might say, oh, here it is, and they do some code changes, and it didn't even fix the problem because it was actually over in this other object. So, uh, improper uses of in clauses. See in clauses like this long, right? Which, who was it just recently? Uh, Aaron Bertrand, maybe? Uh, somebody not too long ago did a nice blog post that showed the difference between uh, 16 or 17, somewhere in there, in pieces, and things change. Maybe it's Paul White. Things change in the optimizer, depending on how many things you have. So big in strings, table valued parameter or some kind of thing like that, join to that or cross apply can be a really, really efficient way to do that in and get rid of those massive strings. Plus, if it's a, literally a string of text that you're putting in, which is often done or numbers, any character difference means a new plan, right? So we have extra plan cache bloat causers there. Correlated subqueries are uh, just monstrous things. Uh, that become very untenable. Uh, chatty, and again, that might work okay in your data center. You want to move it up to AWS or Azure or Google, and it's just not going to work well. I can promise you that. Questions? Yes. You told that uh, bit and uh, the job difference. But if in a table I have one bit, mm -hmm. it's stored in one byte. That is correct. So the, the point was that a bit is literally one bit of, it's eight of them per byte. And if you put only one on a table, it uses one byte because that's the minimum storage value that it can have for data. So one of them will be an eight. But if you have eight of them, they all fit in that same one byte, one to eight. It's just one byte of storage. Eight integers is 32, eight times four. Okay, so you're correct there. And if you go to nine, you get an extra byte. But again, you can go from nine to uh, 17 and still have only two bytes. So, but again, the smallest data type that you need for the storage. It really, it really makes a difference. And if you, even if it doesn't make a difference, quote, to your app's performance now in your data center, move it up to the cloud where the I.O. is an order of magnitude or three worse than what your production SQL Server has in your own data center. Unless you add a zero or two to the monthly outlay that it takes, which is what I've had clients have to do just to get barely minimal functionality in the cloud. And the RAM up there, Price out what VMs or you know, machines look like for RAM or what you get on a WASD Windows Azure SQL database server. 
RAM really becomes critical up there. CPUs are precious too. Moore's Law isn't sitting up in the cloud right now unless you pony up some big money for you know, things like SQL Data Warehouse or something like that. Right? Size matters. Anything else? Yeah? One question. I'm based on my understanding, batch app uh, is, uh, is defining the memory based on the, the input uh, log length. So Varchar, are you talking about a parameter in code or the field no, no, no. storage in the column? We have a Varchar max. Varchar max, okay, as a so, column. And, and before, like when we insert some like bad uh, record, mm -hmm. the uh, that column has, has which has Varchar based on the length of the that uh, our input, the memory is assigned to that. For example, if we have like eight feet. Memory is assigned, uh, but that's not the case for the maxes, it, it won't just say, oh, it's a Varchar 96. I might be putting stuff in there to fill that up. I don't believe that the memory allocation works that way. And for the maxes, remember for max fields on columns, uh, it may stay in the row on the 8K page, right? And there's things you can do to massage that or control it. Or if it's too big, it's automatically going to get a pointer, which if memory serves is like 16 bytes or 14 bytes that says this large object isn't really here in this 8K page in this row, it's actually over there somewhere. And it might be, you know, 400K or it could be up to two gigabytes in size, right? So that's how a, a Varchar Max would work. But only use Max if you really need the, the size, right? Because they carry a substantial amount of uh, overhead with them, right? Other questions? All right. Thanks for attending and I uh, hope you have a good rest of the day. And by the way, there are the, the two links. If you download this deck, you can find the, the, the post and especially the, the GitHub for the source code, all the stuff we showed here. Uh, if you've got Entity Framework on your box or you want to play with it, you can download it and set it up. <laughs>